Well, it's great to be back with all of you uh, on this Sunday. Great thanks to Sandy and John for holding down the worship services while I was gone. And um, the wedding I went to went was, was a great wedding. Uh, really happy uh, for the joy that my aunt and, and our fiancé had found together. Both had lost their spouses about four years ago. And uh, it was a little bittersweet because it kind of, you know, life moves on, right? I kind of standing there thinking, well, yeah, David, really, my uncle really is dead, right? Th- life is moving on, and it was a joy that they could be together and have somebody, you know, as they move forward in, in life together. But, you know, we believe what Jesus said, right? In heaven, we aren't given in marriage as we are here, so it's okay to remarry, and, uh, and you don't belong to someone at the end of our life here. We all obviously recognize each other, but we're not given in marriage as we are, are here. And so we live by that principle uh, in our life. And there are many principles that we live by of our faith that guide the decisions that we make. And in our first reading from the Acts of the Apostles today, we hear Paul sharing some of the principles of, of Paul's faith, which guided the decisions that he led his life, by which he led his life. And he's sharing his principles with people who were completely unfamiliar with the Bible. No understanding the Bible, had never ever seen or heard of a copy of, of the Bible. And so they lived very differently than Paul did. Uh, their ideas of right and wrong were very different than what Paul believed was right and wrong. And so today, Paul goes to the center of the city, the Areopagus, that was a kind of a meeting place of sharing ideas and debating ideas and and discussing, I guess, the news of the day. And Paul decides he is going to share his faith with people who were not familiar at all with his view of the world and how people should live. And what I find is incredibly interesting about this is Paul never quotes to them from the Bible, never says, the book of Genesis says this, or the book of Exodus says that, doesn't bring that up at all, doesn't even mention the name of Jesus either. He doesn't talk about sin or death uh, in the sense that he would have understand that or the right way for living. Instead, he seeks a common ground to begin to try to relate his faith with people with a very understanding of how the world came about, because the Greek worldview was filled with gods and goddesses that people could choose to worship, whereas Paul came from a very different understanding that there was only one true God that was worthy of our worship. And so Paul shares this understanding with them, and obviously it must have worked because they say, well, we'll hear, about, we'll hear from you again at a later time. Now, Greek culture, as I said, it was incredibly religious. There were countless gods and goddesses that you could worship, that you could believe, believe in, that you could offer sacrifice to, depending on what you were seeking to get out of life. So if you were really in love with someone, you could offer a sacrifice to a god or a goddess to make sure that love would flow from both sides, right? So you could truly be in love with one another. If you wanted to be successful in business or at your job, you could worship and offer a sacrifice to another deity to bring a blessing Uh, to your life that you would be successful in business. If you really, really hated somebody, well, you know, put a curse on them, right? Offer a sacrifice, give a gift to this god or goddess, and let's bring, you know, some misfortune to their life. Um, But there was a wide variety of gods and goddesses that you could offer sacrifice to to seek the blessing from in your life. And while Paul is heading to the Areopagus, he notices a shrine that had been built to an unknown God. You know, just to cover the bases, you know, well, there's probably a God we don't know about, so we'll put a shrine up to that God, and and maybe if we need to, and things aren't going well, well, you can offer a sacrifice to that unknown God. Maybe they'll hear you and bring, answer your prayer and offer and, and give you a blessing. And so Paul begins with that common ground right there. He says, hey, you all have the shrine to an unknown God? Well, I know who that unknown God is, and I'm going to share what I know about this unknown God with you today. And so Paul introduces his belief in this one true God, and Paul makes three general points to try to establish common ground with the intention that 
they will be heard again at a later time. Now, we never know if that meeting happened again at a later time or not. We never have any record of what may or may not have happened there. But Paul talks about, to these Greeks, that there is indeed a God who created all things. In fact, Paul believes that by studying nature, you can get a, better, a basic understanding of the nature of God. Paul writes that God has appointed different times for beliefs in this world to thrive. And Paul tells them, and this is a time, a new time, that God has appointed for the dawning of a new age. A new age to come where there will be fundamental change in how people relate to God, the one true God, and how they will fundamentally relate to one another. And lastly, Paul tells the crowd that God has set a future date for judgment, a time when God will judge how well people have responded to God's call for change, change in their relationship with the one true God and change with one another. And as a sign of this new age, Paul says, God raised a man from the dead as a sign for who will make this judgment, a man who is completely faithful to God's call for a righteous life. And that's how their meeting ends. But we can get a wider general understanding of the Judeo-Christian worldview and what those general principles are that should shape our lives by looking at the writings of Paul, by looking at the teachings of Jesus, by looking at scripture and what other Christians have, have written. General principles that should shape how you and I live our life and guide the decisions that we make and how we treat one another. One of these, of course, is that we believe and relate to other people with the understanding that there is one God, right? That there is a sense of judgment coming at some point. And because there is one God who created the human race, that we're all related, we're all brothers and sisters in that way. And we also believe that this God is not only visible in the person of Jesus, but invisible as well. We believe that the material world that we can see and touch and taste and hear is not the only reality that is out there, right? We believe in a reality that cannot be seen. And so we believe in that gift of revelation. We also believe that what we do echoes throughout eternity. And we believe that we can have, that we can live in our life these characters of God to reflect the character of God to the people around us. We also believe in a just and a moral God, and that justice will be prevail. But this creates the expectation that those who worship the one true God will live their lives that reflect that same justice of that God, that same morality or the values of that God by how the individual lives their lives. If you say that God is a God of justice and then lead a life that you lie, cheat, and steal everyone around you, you're not reflecting the character of that God. It makes you, you know, the biggest hypocrite of all. And so there's an expectation in our lives that we will try to reflect the character and nature of God in how we treat our, the people around us. We also believe that human beings were intentionally created and because we were intentionally created, that we were created to reflect the image of God in our world. So we're called upon to reflect that character and nature of God. And lastly, we believe that this created order in which we live is the result of a generous God who believes the world we live in is good, that we are good as well. We may be fallen creatures or broken creatures, but we were created to be good. And because this generous God created the world around us, we are called to be generous in the way we relate to the people around us as well. We're called to be generous with ourselves, right? To be able to show ourselves grace and mercy when we make mistakes, but also to show that same grace and generosity with the people around us when they come up short as well. In fact, Jesus makes it abundantly clear that the most important thing we can do other than loving God is to love and be generous with our neighbor, just as God is, loves and is generous with ourselves. And when we can live a life of that generosity with other people, then we're walking that path that God would have us follow. So what are the principles that guide your life and your deci decision-making each day? 
each week. How do you make these hard decisions? What role does your faith in God or your expectations of God in your life or your expectations that you believe God has for you in living your life, what role do they play in the decisions that you make? And you make those decisions, those fundamental principles uh, known to the people around you. Now, these were kind of general principles, right? There's certainly a time and a place to share specifics about our faith. In fact, the scripture is quite clear about some specifics of our behavior. But if we can live these foundational principles, we can establish common ground with the people around us who may not share those same specifics, but it opens up an opportunity for dialogue with the people around us. When we share that common ground, when we can overlap in those areas in which we agree, it opens an opportunity for a conversation, for us to share our understanding of God and God's expectations for ourselves in worshiping that deity. And when we're able to have those conversations, then we're given that opportunity to hopefully with grace and generosity, share our beliefs with those around us in the hopes that they too will come to an understanding of God that we think will bless the world in a way that brings blessing, not just to us, but to all of God's creation. Let us pray. O oh God, you manifest in your servants the signs of your presence. Send forth upon us the spirit of love that in companionship with one another, your abounding grace may increase among us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.